Fight! <laughs> By the early 80s, personal computers had slowly started entering homes. No one really knew what a personal computer was or what to use it for, but the promise to help educate children and make them smarter, as well as help them learn the tools of the 21st century, ended up convincing middle class parents to purchase them. By December 84, one magazine was reporting over 50 different types of home computers. In fact, for a while it seemed that every electronic manufacturer had their own computer model, which they presented as better and faster than their competitors. Alice Excel Vision, Hector, Thompson, Apple, Sinclair, Atari, Amstrad, Acorn, Commodore, Laser, Aquarius Dragon, Spectra Video. All these machines offered nearly the same capabilities, play, manage, learn and create, but all had different operating systems, different languages and none of them were compatible with one another. Out of this chaotic zoo where everyone was lost in a new world of home computing came the MSX. MSX is the result of the collaboration between two rising companies of the 80s. Japan's ASCII and US-based Microsoft. The idea was to create a range of compatible microcomputers to tap into the home market. For this purpose, a hardware and software standard base was adopted for all manufacturers. So what's inside an MSX? Well, let's have a look. First is a Z80A microprocessor with at least 8 kilobytes of RAM. Next is the VDP video display processor, typically a Texas Instrument TMS9918 or similar offering a resolution of 256 by 192 pixels in glorious 16 colors and 32 sprites. Similar to what you'd find in a ColecoVision or a Spectra video. Music and sound were ensured by the Yamaha sound processor AY368910, that's a mouthful, featuring 3 voices and 8 octaves. A Santronix interface, a tape recorder connector, at least one joystick port, one expansion port and a 70 key keyboard with 5 programmable function keys and 4 arrow keys. And last is a 32KB ROM containing Microsoft's extended version of BASIC. But with MSX being a standard and not a hardware company per se, where did all these specifications come from? This is Japan in the 70s. How do I know that? Well, the video I got in from said it was Japan in the 70s, so yeah. Anyway, in 1976, Katsuhiko Nishi was a student at the prestigious Waseda University in Tokyo. He was already fascinated by the emerging new world of computers, software and electronics. With friends, he set out to create a game that runs on the new model of the Pong processor-based General Instruments AY8500 processor that would be used in the Odyssey 300 console and the Coleco Telstar. Nishi wanted to build a console himself with his own games and resell it. To this end, he visited the General Instruments factory to purchase some chips but was told that they were not available as retail orders in small quantities. So without enough money to purchase a large order of chips, he decided to abandon the idea of creating it himself. Though disappointed, he did not give up on the idea entirely and decided that if he could not sell his game, he would instead sell the information on how to build it. His article was published in the magazine, which turned out to be very successful and from this point he continued writing articles on video game for several other magazines. One day he decided that instead of writing for others, he should create his own book and publish it. So Nishi decided to drop out of college and focus on this, which was the most un-Japanese thing to do, especially from a top school like Waseda, and he began publishing a PC magazine called I.O. 1977, with two friends, he found ASCII to publish I.O. He later dropped the magazine for another more professional looking publication dealing with electronics and video games, ASCII magazine. But Nishi realized that writing articles and testing software were simply just not good enough. So believing he could do better, he decided on a second attempt at making software himself. 
but for that he would need a programming language. So one night in August 77, Nishi picked up the phone to call Microsoft and ask to talk to the president. Surprisingly, Bill Gates decided to take the call and the two young men began to talk. At the end of their conversation, Nishi offered Bill Gates a plane ticket to Tokyo so they could meet in person. However, Bill Gates declined the offer as he was too busy to travel in person and they agreed that Nishi would fly over. And they finally met in person two months later at a computer show. The two young men discussed their interest, professional background and expertise for over nine hours and realized that they had a lot in common. Both men were 21 year old, came from the same social background and had both left university to create their respective businesses and they both had the same passion about computing and were confident that the software and the computer market would soon explode. So after some discussion the two men agreed to do business together. Their personalities complemented each other very well. Nishi was affable, persuasive and had all the talents you would expect of a skilled businessman, while Gates had a more technical and theoretical approach of things. And there it was, a partnership of ASCII and Microsoft Corporation that would transform the burgeoning software market into an industry. In fact, Nishi became the vice president of Microsoft and his company, ASCII, became the official representative of Microsoft in Japan. Kazuhiko Nishi, or K as his friends call him, wanted to prove himself to his new business partner. He knew that Neck Corporation was working on a personal computer and called Kazuya Watanabe, manager at Neck Corporation, and convinced him to come to the United States to meet with Bill Gates and Paul Allen, the co founder of Microsoft. The meeting with the young owners of Microsoft was conclusive. Watanabe was impressed by this young man. He went back to Tokyo with a project that he presented to his company's board of directors making a computer with the support of Microsoft and ASCII. By 1979, the project was completed and the Next PC-8000 was born, Japan's first home computer. It is also the first home computer with the built-in basic language from Microsoft. It was a commercial success and a great opportunity for Microsoft and ASCII to demonstrate their expertise. In July 1980, IBM reached out to Microsoft to ask them to develop an operating system for their new computer. Bill Gates was not enthusiastic about this, Microsoft was already overbooked and had never created an operating system before. Furthermore, there was no guarantee that their computer with this operating system would ever be released. Gates initially suggested to IBM to ask around at Digital Research for a license of their operating system, CPM, Control Program for Microcomputers. However, IBM was unable to reach a deal with Gary Kendall, the owner of Digital Research and inventor of CPM. IBM then turned back to Microsoft, which had already agreed to provide the basic language. It was Nishi who persuaded Bill Gates to agree. So Gates finally agreed and promised IBM an operating system. However, not having the time to develop such a system from scratch, Gates decided to search for one that could be adapted for IBM. And it was Tim Patterson of Seattle Computer Products who provided them with what they were looking for. Patterson had developed an operating system called 86DOS or QDOS for Quick and Dirty Operating System. This was exactly what Gates was looking for, and he bought 86DOS for $50,000 and renamed it to PC-DOS and proposed it to IBM. In 1981, Nishi imagined a briefcase-sized computer with an LCD screen. During a trip between Japan and the United States, he met with Kazuo Inamoro, president of Kyocera Corp, and persuaded him to produce his new type of computer. This would become the portable Radio Shack 100, the first laptop computer. Microsoft and ASCII designed the software parts and sold the license on three continents to the Olivetti and Tandy brands. By 1982, Harry Fox and Alex Weiss, two Swiss watchmakers who had been migrating to the US in the 1950s and created Spectra Vision, decided to produce a computer. With the help of Tony Law, a Hong Kong entrepreneur at the hand of electronic company Bondwell, they envisioned a new architecture for computer that would cost $30 to produce and would sell for $100. 
The concept was developed around the Z80 processor, a Texas Instrument VDP and a Yamaha sound chip. So with a hardware concept in hand and a manufacturer to make the machine, they were on the right track to complete their project. They now needed software for it. For this, they needed Microsoft. And after several attempts, it was in September 82 that they were able to reach out to Nishi. After receiving the specification of the new computer, Nishi became very excited about Spectra Video's project and immediately caught a flight to Hong Kong to meet with Spectra Video. Nishi was keenly aware of the market segmentation. Many home computer brands had been unable to communicate and exchange software. This was an annoying situation for users, but also for businesses. At this time, Nishi's company ASCII held 30% of the software market in Japan. This was in large part due to his partnership with Microsoft, but Nishi knew that with a standardized home computer market, growth would be easier, and he was not the only one to think this. In Japan, the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication had wished to use home computers for communication. Essentially, all the largest electronics company in the world at the time had already called out for a standardization of the industry and a clear idea of what was desirable had already started to emerge. Nishi immediately understood that the configuration proposed by Harry Fox was extremely flexible and would even be able to compete with more expensive desktop configuration with far superior capabilities than the IBM PC for sounds and graphics. At the same time, the Coleco company was preparing the release of a revolutionary console in August 82, the Coleco Vision. The hardware architecture of the console was designed by Eric Brumley, a clever engineer who had worked in the arcade industry at Midway and was hired by Coleco. The architecture of the Coleco Vision was similarly based on the Z80 processor and the Texas Instrument VDP which were very close to the specs of the Spectra video computer. We know that Coleco subcontracted part of its production in Hong Kong's train Bitcorp, but was there a technology exchange in Hong Kong? Was the architecture of the machine designed by Fox, Vice and Locke copied from the Coleco vision? Some sources speculate that it was Spectra video that licensed its hardware design to Coleco in 1982. After all, SVI also released the SV603, an adapter to run the ColecoVision games on the Spectra video computer. It's indeed hard to imagine that the similarities between the three systems is the result of pure luck. This was a time where information was more willingly shared and people moved between companies, so I find myself quite willing to believe that the ColecoVision console might have inspired the Spectra video in some way and consequently the MSX. Anyway, the three machines, the ColecoVision, Spectra Video and MSX are so close in hardware architecture that the Spectra Video can both run the MSX software and the ColecoVision games with an appropriate adapter, the SV606 and SV603. But let's get back to the story. Once at Spectra Video's offices in Hong Kong, Nishi proposed to make some changes to the original design. He reorganized the overall architecture of the computer to make it easily expandable. He increased the ROM capacity and promised that Microsoft would develop a version of BASIC more powerful than the IBM PCs, even allowing for the addition of a floppy disk drive, setting up an easily programmable interrupt system and making the keyboard easy to use for word processing. But with these new changes in place, producing the computer for $30 would no longer be an option. Nishido ensured that the computer would cover many needs, whether in business or leisure, and with a cartridge ROM expansion area, he promised Vice and Fox that they would be able to sell this machine for 5 years and would benefit from it as the technology evolved and production costs fell. Spectre Video had its computer, the SVI-318, and was launched in January 83 at CES in Las Vegas with a launch price of $600. Again, people familiar with the MSX will recognize the similarities with the startup screen and the boot sequence. So while Spectra Video was busy building and marketing their home computer, Nishi had been visiting the leading Japanese electronics companies. He had carried with him a mock-up of the Spectra Video SV328 and showed off its diverse features. He knew the platform was ideal to launch a home computer standard. The Matsushita leaders had been especially impressed and had seen the Spectra Video as an ideal basis for their project of a home computer standard that would be accepted by the entire Japanese electronic industry. 
Nishi has also convinced most of the Japanese electronic manufacturers to adopt a standard based on the presented specifications. The companies that joined in were Casio, Canon, Fujitsu, Hitachi, Victor, Kyocera, Mitsubishi, Nek, Yamaha, Pioneer, Sanyo, Sharp, Sony, Toshiba, as well as Korea's Gold Star, now LG, Samsung, Daewoo and a bit later Philips in Europe. In 1983, Nishi called Harry Fox to tell him that the entire Japanese industry wanted to license their home computer design. Harry Fox felt a bit overwhelmed and was not ready to negotiate with the entire Japanese industry. Moreover, it would mean that he would have to admit that much of the design consisted of Nishi's idea. So Fox offered Nishi a deal. He told Nishi to prepare a new design, different enough so that they would not have to license it from them but close enough so that it could make their machine, the Spectra Video, compatible with an adapter. And there it was, the MSX project was born. Hi guys, thanks for watching and I hope you've enjoyed it and do stay tuned for part 2. I want to say a huge thank you to Eric Wes for letting me use his article on the story of the MSX and do check out his website, he's making all sort of cool stuff and hardware for the platform. And if you found the video interesting, you can always click the subscribe button to be notified as soon as I post a new one.